Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me again with Along With My Thoughts. But this episode, I'm actually not alone. While I'm sitting with you or sitting now in the desert and 112 degree temperatures, this is a visit I made up to Reno, Nevada to a very different place that offers a very different modality relative to health, healing, and well-being and with a very different mind. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Gary Buchanan of the Steamboat Mineral Springs and Spa. You're photogenic, Gary. We're, we're talking <laughs> Dr. Gary Buchanan. We're at the Steamboat, Sp Steamboat Springs? Steamboat Healing Center, uh, Steamboat Geothermal Hot Springs. Okay. In uh, Steamboat, uh, Nevada, or Reno, Nevada. What's, what's, <laughs> we're right outside of Reno. Well, we, we're just on the city limits of Reno, yes, yeah, south of Reno. Okay, all right then. You're doing some amazing stuff. Uh, and I say amazing because it's very different from the norm. Uh, I think that's probably what we, uh, how we could best say it. You're working under uh, and within some, um, some concepts and principles that, um, uh, well, not a lot of places can, uh, are, are offering. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about that to just get, get that started. Okay, well, we began uh, 42 years ago uh, working at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, I got into cymatics and uh, the synergetics of Buckminster Fuller. Now, cymatics, of course, is uh, visualizing sound and on a vibrating disc with powders or pastes and you can also visualize the patterns in water. And we mostly work with the patterns that we can observe in water, such as this image on the screen, which is a frequency being played in a couple drops of water under high magnification. The frequencies that we use uh, in sound healing now, 42 years later, are all imaged and studied as cymatic formations. So, we can tell by their geometries how effective they are, how harmonic they are, how resonant they are, and the kinds of uh, archetypes that they're actually putting into the body when you're using sound therapy on the body. Now, following the principle of synergetics that I mentioned, it takes five frequencies to create a standing wave geodesic uh, sound wave. Okay. And so, if we play our five frequency sonations, combinations are arrays into water, then we get obviously far more complex geometries, but we can actually classify sonations. For example, if we have uh, a set of frequencies for general arthritis, we have a set of frequencies for rheumatoid arthritis, we have uh, uh, osteoid arthritis, other kinds of arthritis, we know that those sonations that we've developed all have the same kinds of geometries. All right. Okay. So, so this allows there are patterns that are actually, um, I'm not that they're standard, but they they are identifiable and repeatable patterns. They're re definitely repeatable, and they're recognizable after a while. It takes quite a while actually to get used to to looking at the cymatics because it's very difficult to uh, classify cymatics scientifically. It requires incredible mathematical formula just to calculate the, the big, uh, smallest changes in molecular structures in water, for example. And people have written papers on this and tried to explain how it's all working. But basically, the size of the dish, the amount of water, the amplitude that you're playing through it, the range of the sound, and so forth, all these elements determine the geometry. Mm -hmm. So if there's too much amplitude, you may get something not good. If there's too little, you may get something not good. If there's just the right amount, you might get a standing wave. Uh, increase the amplitude, it may turn into something else. Mm -hmm. So it takes a while, uh, touch and go, mm -hmm. trying to observe these uh, formations and what they're doing. But 
over the years, if you keep working with this, then you began to recognize things and, and the repeated, uh, repeatable sequences that things do follow. So that's how we do it. And that's probably a, a, a salient point to make for a, a listener or a viewer, is that once you have figured this out, uh, when we say it's repeatable, uh, it's e essentially a form such as the one we have uh, showing behind us here mm -hmm. is not by happenstance. That form, once you know how it is created and the parameters by which it shows up, you can create that form, recreate that form anytime and every time you want. Well, and that is the principle. So each sonation that we've built, and we have about 2,500 that we've built for every kind of uh, condition applicable to the body and its bioresonances. So we know what the optimal resonances for muscle tissues are. We know that 22.5 hertz is the cell membrane absorption frequency. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, when you put sound in the body, there's a, a, a great deal of uh, dissipation and absorption by the tissues themselves. So for example, Paul Nogier, the great French uh, doctor who worked with sound, uh, discovered that if he wanted to use 9 hertz in the body, he would have to make it 9.125 to overcome what's called tissue interface. Sure, sure. Interference, of yeah, course. Exactly. Excellent. So, so these are the kinds of things we've been studying and working with, and so now we have sonations that help alleviate a great many conditions. We can definitely affect neurological conditions and muscular conditions and uh, inflammation and swelling and nerve tone and uh, hundreds of things like that, because we know what the signature or optimal resonances are on the bioresonant level, mm -hmm. and if the body is functioning on those uh, fundamental rates, if the organs are following good resonance, then you will be healthier, and the body is more capable of repairing itself and, and protecting itself and overcoming uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, the water is very, very important, because when we put the cymatic sound on the body, that geometry is going into the body. Mm -hmm. And the body itself is 70% bulk water, 99% water if you include all the molecules. <laughs> That's correct, yes. So, uh, if, if we're seeing these geometries in water, then we know that that same geometry is taking place on uh, the, the waters in the body and on many different levels. It's not just one uh, geometric form here, it's millions of those same geometries propagating mm -hmm. through the system. Mm -hmm. So, the, and we call those uh, archetypes mm -hmm. because they, they follow chains of reproduction and they assimilate. Uh, the water inside the body is uh, called visceral or vicinal water, depending on whether it's the bulk water or whether it's the water actually surrounding cells and tissues. And that water is called uh, fourth phase or easy water, which is Dr. Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington. Correct, yes. And uh, interestingly, when you have a disc of water and on a speaker and you're observing the cymatic geometries, that surface water in the dish is also fourth phase easy water. Mm -hmm. So we know that if it's making these geometries in that surface water of just a few drops of water, then those same geometries are going to be taking place in the same viscosity of the water inside the body. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if we're treating bulk water and then putting those sounds in the body. We're actually treat, treating with the cymatics uh, easy water mm -hmm. to a great extent, mm -hmm. and we're putting those sounds in the body to go with the easy water in the body. So these understandings have been accruing every year now, especially since Dr. Pollack came out with his book several years ago, we're beginning to understand more and more and more about what's really going on with these molecular structures, mm -hmm. hexagonal growths, pentagonal growths, uh, with spectroscopy, how we can uh, determine the alkalinity, acidity, uh, and so forth of these fluids. So it's an emerging science, and our technology, which uses the sound, uh, geothermal water, uh, light and color, uh, that we call the soma therapy. Mm -hmm. We're including all of these uh, elements that are natural in the environment in one process, the 
cymatics, you're getting all of those things. You're getting the, the uh, light and color, the air, the water, the sound, all of your vital energies, and the sacred geometry, mm -hmm. which we know from physics is also important. Absolutely. Well, of course, uh, the geometries, uh, as your screensaver just uh, went on, which is uh, was okay, it's good, because uh, that was a beautiful pattern, a geometric pattern, and, and that is the thing about the frequencies, the repeatability of it, because when you put and you, you set specific types of frequencies, you get different geometries. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've also seen and it's been observed. I was talking to a, a gentleman interviewing um, uh, just recently and he was, we were talking about vortexes and tornadoes, for example. Mm -hmm. And in the sense though, is that various geometric patterns and forms have been observed when you're looking down into a vortex. And, and of course, rotational velocities, speed, depending on that rotational velocity, it determines what geometric form actually shows up at a given point in that vortex. And so it's also a part of this repeatable creation process, so to speak, is what you're saying. Well, you know, exactly. Uh, but the important thing that people should understand about cymatics is you could take a frequency, let's say 90 hertz to 111 hertz. This is the beta endorphin triggering range of the brain. But if you put 90 to 111 hertz in water, you're going to get some very clear geometries because it's a very resonant, good range to, to visualize these patterns. And of course, once again, if you use a little more water, you're going to get a different pattern. If you use uh, more amplitude, you're going to get a slightly different pattern and so forth. So yes, these are reproducible, mm -hmm. but it's a whole process. Every sound in water follows the same processional growth. Mm -hmm. It starts as uh, what we call vesicopisis, two mm -hmm. spheres mm -hmm. merging. It begins to triangulate it begins to make uh, hexagonal and pentagonal patterns, mm -hmm. which become indicative of, if, if you could see it in three-dimensional space, then you'll begin to see an octahedron, you would see a dodecahedron, mm -hmm. you would see an icosahedron, you would see a vector equilibrium, you would see these growths of geometries. Mm -hmm. All sounds follow those patterns of growth. No matter where they are, those are the patterns they're going to follow. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, of course, the geometries will be slightly different with each frequency and each resonance, but they all follow that growth. So if someone tells you, uh, this is C, and this is the pattern that C makes, I would say, well, that's C, and that's one of the patterns C makes. <laughs> uh -huh. But that's not the one and only pattern that C will make. Mm -hmm. And if people say, well, here's a Beethoven Symphony Number no. 5, Here's the cymoglyph of that. I'll say, well, that's a cymoglyph of one resonance in Beethoven's fifth, but it's right, not the right. entire symphony. Come on, give me a break here. Sure, sure. <laughs> We're talking millions of geometric patterns that the sound is making. So that's the other thing we want to make clear. But the, the point being, if you know that a sound is healing, mm -hmm. and then it's very stable and you are getting good geometries, then that helps confirm the idea that there's something special about that frequency and that resonance that's not applicable to say one hertz lower or one hertz higher mm -hmm. or a different version mm -hmm. if you see what I'm saying. So right. that's the other thing we do is we do a lot of tweaking. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of gradual shifts in frequencies just to see what will happen. Mm -hmm. Now I recall you, um, you're a musician at one point. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying past tense, maybe you still are? <laughs> well, I still am a musician, but I did, I did my doctorate in music in 1976. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I was around, so, and I wasn't necessarily that young then, so but that's all right. I still, I still compose, and I still conduct, and I, I still remain very active in, in, in music with local orchestras and, and so forth. And uh, I, I am published and recorded and all that kind of thing. But the, the point being, it takes a musician to really understand this whole idea. Yeah, so I was wondering how, how you transitioned and maybe the, it was the music that was the gateway for you. I was studying music, doing my doctorate, and that's when I got into the cymatics and I got into the 
uh, geometry and the healing. And I looked around and I said, well, what are people doing with this? And people are using singing bowls and tuning forks and chanting and doing all kinds of using harps for music therapy and so forth. And I said, well, but there's got to be a more fundamental scientific basis for all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, what frequencies do the nerves respond to? What frequencies does the liver respond to? Mm -hmm. These sorts of things. What, what are the cell resonances that can make that cell regenerate? Mm -hmm. And that's when my, I realized, well, nobody's doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, well, I guess I better start looking into this because somebody needs to do this mm -hmm. and clarify the field. And so that's how I got into it, and that's how we developed this entire therapy. I think that was one of the other things. You know, you are mentioning the word that people don't hear too often when they're talking uh, matters of well-being and stuff, particularly when we're talking matters of chronic uh, conditions, the words you mentioned is regenerate. Mm -hmm. And what many people don't really appreciate is that regeneration is, is also part of the matrix. It's also part of the possibility that, that oftentimes doesn't get ex not only explored, it doesn't, if you don't explore something, it doesn't even get in our, the way we do remediative health work today, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But regeneration is a very important word because it is, there's some reality to it. I mean, you're describing a, a quid pro quo situation here, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. So when did you discover that regeneration was possible and, and, uh, and in, well, in what ways? I'll give you a case example. Sure. And we've talked about this before, I believe, but uh, uh, when I first started doing this, uh, a friend of my daughter's, a construction worker, had had a, a couple ton weight fall on his foot and crush his foot. And the doctors patched it all up and put it in a cast and gave him some drugs for the pain and told him to come back in a couple of weeks. Well, when he came back, the entire foot was so swollen and uh, mucousy and yellow and blue and black tissues and he had developed gangrene. And so then they were going to amputate his foot. And so I said, well, uh, my daughter told him, well, before you do that, go see Dad. So he came to see me, and I set up a foot bath with water, with speakers under the foot bath, running the sound through the water, because it goes into the body faster if it comes through water. Uh, four and a half times faster sound travels in water. And I sat and talked with him and played some of these sonations into his feet while we were talking. And 45 minutes later, the pain was gone. A lot of the swelling was gone uh, and the inflammation. And then he was able to even lace his boot over the foot. And a couple weeks later, uh, the gangrene was completely gone. Mm -hmm. And the foot had begun to regenerate. And then within a couple months, his foot was, for all intents and purposes, back to normal. Of course, it was still malformed. Some of the bones hadn't properly healed or set and so forth, but at least he had a foot, and he could use it. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's regeneration. Mm -hmm. We regenerated those cells with simple sounds. And I said, well, I guess I better start taking this a lot more seriously than I had been before, mm -hmm. because if we just save this man's foot, maybe other mm -hmm. things can happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the ways I got into this to begin with, I have a friend, Yukonori Matsushita, who works in Japan. Uh, he and his wife had a little girl when they were living in London, and the baby was born uh, with the femur not in the hip, no. totally disconnected. Mm -hmm. And there was no opening in the pelvis to receive the femur. Oh, okay. So they took went to the doctor and took the x-rays and the doctor said, well, we'll have to implant a pin to hold the bone to the pelvis and then every year of her life till she stops growing at 21 or something, we'll have to replace that pin so that her balance will be okay. But yeah. she'll always have this condition and she will always limp and be a, mm -hmm. a, a, a cripple. And Yuki says, well, gosh, that's terrible. And his wife was a, a chief nurse at the hospital, and she was beside herself and said, well, there's got to be something we can do besides that. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, well, go see Dr. Manners. Now, Dr. Manners was doing cymatic therapy in northern England and considered by the establishment a kook. Mm -hmm. So they drove six hours to see Dr. Manners, and Dr. Manners said, oh, yeah, we can cure that. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> and Yuki says, what do you mean, cure? <laughs> you know, well, we can fix that. Mm -hmm. You'll see. Mm -hmm. So I gather they uh, gave the girl, this infant, just a few weeks old, uh, sound on the hip mm -hmm. at that area mm -hmm. for only around 15 minutes. And then they came back every week for the next six weeks, 15 minute sessions on this infant's hip. And at the end of uh, the, the seventh week, they took her back to the hospital and had it x-rayed and the femur was in the hip. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. And I should point out, I have met this girl, I've met Yuki's daughter, and uh, she's in her young 20s now. She's finished uh, college, top of her class in London, and she does break dancing on the side. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, it's very, very normal now. So that was when Yuki says, well, I'm going to start getting into this and studying this, because if you can do that, what, what else can yes, you do? Yes, you're exactly right. And yeah. that is your, the regeneration you're talking about, and, and the reason it worked. Uh, and this works with almost all children, mm -hmm because their metabolism is so high mm -hmm. and they're growing so fast and sh cells are regenerating so rapidly mm -hmm. that just applying the morphogenetic resonances that apply to those areas, mm -hmm. these are the normal cell rates that those bones should be building and connecting and so forth. She just finally grew it like it was supposed to. In other words, she had not finished growing when she was born. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and uh, you could say that the proper frequencies during uh, prenatal uh, uh, or the proper frequency environment prenatal, there were some, some, some I guess, uh, discordant, discordant or whatever you want to say, but they weren't there. Yeah. And yet, in applying them, even after birth, normalcy came back anyway. Yes, and it's, it's normal with children. Uh, children have all kinds of injuries and pains and bruises and this and that. Mm -hmm. And I can treat them here in, my, uh, in our clinic. Uh, and in 15 minutes, they rock out playing mm -hmm. because they respond so quickly to the sound. Mm -hmm. The inflammation just goes away, the swelling goes away, the, the pain goes away, everything. Is, they're, they're just fine now because they have no preconceptions, intellectual preconceptions, and their bodies are still uh, rapidly regenerating. And so the proper memory, the signature frequencies, tell the body what to do. The other thing that you're saying too, relative to water and being applied on the body and relative to cymatics, is that it is not only, it's not two dimensional then. When you're applying it to, in a treatment situation, it actually is three dimensional. It's that frequency and those patterns are distributed throughout Exactly. At, at the speed of water, so to speak, as exactly. well. Exactly, and, and they're three-dimensional because, as I said, we're using Fuller's formula of five frequencies, mm -hmm. and we also harmonically tune them so that they're all in the same phase and of the same basic pulse rates and fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So they're creating not only a, a, a wave front that's three-dimensional, but they're holding together and they're resonating in perfect coherence. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and, that's these are, and these are analog sounds, too. And analog sound is far better than digital sound, absolutely. Digital can work, but it doesn't work nearly as well as analog, and so it's, I, I worry about our whole... How do you manage to get an analog sound now when everything is digital? Well, we, had, we spent uh, seven years developing this unit here. Uh, it's called the Sonic Analog Box, and it uh, produces analog frequencies, and we have a program on the computer that runs the box, mm -hmm. and then we take the sound out of the box with sound applicators that are uh, delivered through a very good neodymium speaker, through a, a bamboo head, so that we get both the tactile vibration from this nodule as well as the sound wavefront that's being produced. Mm -hmm. And this goes right into the body, it stays where you put it, and then it also vibrates the areas around and begins traveling through the entire bloodstream, bone structures, meridians, acupoints, bong and ducts. Every part of the body is receiving those vibrations. So I could be treating an injury on the hand and somebody's headache will go away. Or I could be treating the knee 
and their back pain pain will stop. Kind of a reflexology situation there. There's almost a. And so the point being, there are no wrong sounds. If they're good resonances, if they sound good, if they make a beautiful geometry, they're going to fix something mm -hmm. or That's help true. fix something. <laughs> Actually, a lot sometimes things we don't know need to be fixed. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And the other thing I was going to say is when we actually have summations that we can put over the body, and this is why being a musician helps, you can go up and down the body with the applicator, and you can hear the variations in the sound as you go up and down the body. Mm -hmm. It may get louder, it may get softer, it may become distorted. You, some of the harmonics. You can, so you're aware of the variances, and, and that's telling you something about the particular area that's being cover too, isn't it? That tells you that there's something going on there for sure. Mm -hmm. In other words, if it's really loud all of a sudden, that tells you, well, there's a lot of energy there that's pushing those sound waves up mm -hmm. and changing the harmonics. Perhaps there's some, uh, a lot of energy there, or there, maybe there's some inflammation, or maybe there's an injury or some pain or something that's causing that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I go to another, another area and the sound is completely absorbed and gets quiet, say, my goodness, there's no energy here at all. Mm -hmm. There's no resistance to those simple vibrational sound waves. Mm -hmm. And so you want to apply more energy there to see if you can't raise the level. And of course you can. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to balance the entire field of the body on the uh, skin level, on the etheric level, the, the one to two inch field that surrounds the morphogenetic body. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, we have practitioners with clinics who are working in all the fields, the etheric, the astral, the mental, mm -hmm. the causal, and you can actually hear these anomalies in the fields. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole key, hearing. It's a musical concept. It's the idea of, is that harmonic? Is that in tune? Is that distorted? Is that soft? Is that loud? Is it pulsing? Is it dead? <laughs> and, and I can be treating someone and I'll say, I'm, we're not getting a very good sound from your knee. Say, oh yeah, I had a ski accident last year and I tore the meniscus and... <laughs> there you go. It makes sense, yes. <laughs> well, let's fix the meniscus. Let's put some tendon stuff in there to see if we can repair those tissues. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple concept, perhaps too simple. And so that's why a lot of scientists probably don't take it seriously because they say, well, it's not really... Uh, peer-reviewed and... <laughs> well, it's not complicated, and it also gets some really darn good results. But we get good results. Yeah, yeah. I've never had a dissatisfied client over 20-some years now. I've, now, you've mentioned the word sonation, mm -hmm. and I'm also uh, familiar with, there's a system which I know I'm opening up to uh, called spectrochrome. Mm -hmm. uh, their treatment was called tonations from Dinshaw Gadiali, mm -hmm. and your kind of melding that too, aren't you? Well, are yes, you? I've, I've got uh, Dinshaw's books and I've been studying him for 40 years. And I have all of his filters from the Dinshaw Society and we, we use those in therapies. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing that we are doing now is we're putting the sound and the light together. In other words, if I have a five frequency sonation and it's in tune, it's coherent, mm -hmm. and I have a light source that's filtered and in tune and coherent, mm -hmm and I play the two together in synchrony, then there's a, a bonding that takes place between the color and light and the sound waves. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a technique where we actually run the sound through the light uh, with the light circus and we pulse the light and color mm -hmm. with that sound so that they're totally in synchrony with one another. Mm -hmm. So when we put the color over the body and we put the sound over the body, they both marry and help carry those color frequencies, of, let's say near infrared, which is good for a lot of things, mm -hmm. and you're using uh, that on the tissue and you're using the sound to help regenerate that tissue, well, it's a, a no-brainer. Of course you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. We've also developed a technology now where we actually put the sound on the light beams. It's called Wi-Fi. It's becoming very popular, which means that the light beams are carrying the sound, but you don't hear it because it's on the light beams. But if you take a photocell attached to an amplifier and you shine the light beam on the photocell, the sound will come out of the amplifier, mm -hmm. which means the wow. sound is on the light beam. You just don't hear it, but you feel it. <laughs> That's almost kind of a noise-canceling phenomenon if you, you, uh, uh, until or coming through a tunnel, <laughs> so to speak. So we're developing applicators to be able to do this and, and light systems for homes 
Can you imagine if you came in your home and all of your lights were actually tuned to a musical frequency or Mozart, you're not hearing it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And well, it's how much electromagnetic pollution is that going to break up? How much yeah. nurturing and regeneration is that going to do for you and your entire family and the entire environment in which you're living if it is a harmonically entrained environment just from the light in the room and the sound? Absolutely, in the absolutely. You're so right. We, we believe that's a worldwide concept. If we could find somebody to help us do that, we could get the system into every domicile on the planet inexpensively so that people could simply have lights that play the best possible resonances into their homes mm -hmm. instead of getting sick from the fluorescence and the bad LEDs and the twisty bulbs and all this stuff. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, and that's probably something that bears discussing because, you know, we're talking about frequencies. You're talking about the corrective power of frequencies and what we're not saying essentially is that the conditions that those corrective frequencies are addressing are themselves frequencies. Mm -hmm. They are themselves results of conditions that put things out of phase, you yes, could say. Exactly. All right. And our environments, such as the typical the lights in our houses and our offices and our places of work, I'll give you an example. I was talking to some people, and he was, this gentleman works in a uh, what's considered a high security area, and just looking at him, he was puffed, puffy, you know, uh, inflamed, not fat, but still, uh, you can just look and see. But j before this person traveled, he experienced he ended up having a nosebleed that wouldn't stop for a while. And it took them a while. They had to actually change their trip until they could get that under control. And I simply asked, I said, tell me about his, his environment. What is he where? They said high security. Tell me about this high security environment. I said, are there any lights in this place? Are there any windows? No windows. So then what about the lights? What about the air? What about the energy of this space? Okay. No, and how many hours a day is he there? And then what about your home? <laughs> you know, people don't think about this stuff. No, they, they're killing themselves by surrounding themselves with electromagnetic pollution, microwave pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, every home now has a, a couple dozen electrical things going on all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the digital sound we know is not natural. It's, it's artificial. It's sampled sound waves. It's not natural analog sound waves like you would get just the human voice or singing or musical instruments or out of doors in nature. These are manufactured things mm -hmm. and everyone is listening to them and using them now all the time for everything. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not being alarmist, but obviously all those kinds of frequencies and those shapes and those patterns, those geometries have to have some kind of effect on your bioresonance system. <laughs> How about a disruptive one? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's why we use analog sound for healing, because it's better. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're trying to pulse the color and light and sound together, because it's better. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are trying to get the life system going where people can actually change the environment in the home. Theoretically, with the proper wattage, you could erase any electromagnetic pollution in your home, even with the refrigerator and TV and everything going, mm -hmm. if the lights are, are entraining the environment with these uh, light sound wavefronts mm -hmm. and these sacred geometries. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it defies comprehension that people do surround themselves with so many deleterious frequencies, and that's 90% of what we're trying to do fight with conditions is reverse the wrong frequencies that have become entrained with the proper frequencies by a simple process of entrainment. That's true. You know, what you're saying is, again, is, is, is very is important. In the absence of the proper natural frequency patterns uh, in the environment, there is very little for the organism to entrain too. Exactly. So you need it present. So that's kind of the first fundamental thing. Because <laughs> if it's present, 
it knows what it is. You can say it knows. There will be a natural affinity. That's what entrainment is about. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very obvious thing to observe in nature and society. Mm-hmm. Uh, kids who participate in music in school, mm-hmm. who are in an ensemble or they, or they make music with others or sing or whatever, mm-hmm. it's been scientifically proven time and time again, they develop more uh, cerebellum, uh, up to 20% more cerebellum. Mm-hmm. Their sense of balance is better. Their sense of uh, socialization is obviously better because they've had to learn to work with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, a great many parts of the brain are heightened and developed because of that just making and being part of music, even if they're not very good. Mm-hmm. When I was teaching public, uh, not public school, I taught in a private school for a while, and I made every kid in the school play a musical instrument. And some of them really were bad. I said, that doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. That doesn't matter. You're using the sounds. You're fitting into the group. You're learning the feeling and the essence and the energies of the music. And that's going to be good for you. Mm-hmm. Harmonics. Talk about harmonics and discord, etc. Et You're becoming aware of all of those things as well. Sure. Yeah, and they're, now they're, well, I've worked with uh, Dr. Harvey, who's written papers and worked in hospitals for 30, 40 years where they use music therapy. And then there's uh, Dallas and Susan Smith here in Reno who have a, a worldwide company that supplies music for hospital rooms for healing with videos. So pe- people can watch beautiful nature videos and hear beautiful music and it helps them get better faster. Mm-hmm. It's just that simple. There are even doctors who perform surgery without anesthesia Mm -hmm. and they have a live musician in the room playing music and that so calms and preoccupies the person that they can perform the operation without the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. That shows you the power of sound just on the psychological level. Yeah, yeah. There is also there is a physiological th- as well because the sound also helps facilitate the connection of the uh, of the hemispheres. That's right. Okay, so you got both. You got those things happening. Well, if I, you get the right frequencies going, as I was mentioning, uh, ninety to one hundred eleven hertz, which is the beta endorphin triggering range, mm-hmm. that means if you're playing music that has those harmonics and in those keys, mm-hmm. you're going to be triggering the production of serotonin. During the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be blissed out. <laughs> and that is quite literally <laughs> a no-brainer. <laughs> so to speak, yes. <laughs> wow, wow. Very good, very good. Well, what are your thoughts about the propagation and the adoption of these methods? I mean, you're still presently a kind of an island of sanity in, in a world, in an insane world that thinks you're insane. Well, exactly, exactly. Uh, but I am more and more uh, being accepted. And we do have, as I said, now we do have clinics. We have uh, many students and practitioners now in Japan. Japan is very open to this concept mm-hmm. because they're actually very sensitive to these ancient concepts of using sound for healing. Mm-hmm. Duh. <laughs> And we have people in Europe who are very interested in doing the practice. I have a student in Australia. I have one in Czechoslovakia. I've got one in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So it's catching on. Okay. And we do have a, a training course at our website, which I'll give sonotherapy.com. Mm-hmm. We have a training course where we actually spend a year, after people have read my two books, they, they uh, take a year training course with lessons each month and constant uh, conversations taking place. And then they come here for a day or two, and we observe them actually treating people with the therapy to make sure they know what they're doing, and then we can license them. Mm-hmm. So we're doing that now, and that's working very well. Mm-hmm. So I'm being invited to conferences. We are getting students. People are buying my books. Mm-hmm. And gradually, it's going to get out there. But it's, uh, it's just a matter of people becoming more conscious of this and accepting the concept. People just don't believe the sound and light and color can heal. And I'm saying, but you, you, your whole life is based on the sun, which is putting out light and color and sound mm-hmm. all the time, which is responsible for your, everything that we are, and yet you think that light and color and sound don't have anything to do with your health. Well, you know something, 
people find it much easier to appreciate that unkind words do harm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if unkind words do harm, and you can do it on a scientific, if you can do it on an emotional, you can, do, you can look at it on a lot of different ways. Why can't kind or why can't coherent patterns I mean, what we need to establish is this truth that everything has its number, it has its place, there is a frequency, all of creation, <laughs> you could say, you can say it's electrical, you can say is there's numbers, there's geometric, the, all of these things are part of the matrix that is what we are and, and what we're experiencing life through, and so there are correct, let us say, configurations, and there are incorrect ones. <laughs> okay, simple as that. <laughs> well, it's in the it's in the overtone series of music, mm -hmm. which is the overtone series of nature, yes. which is the naturally occurring frequencies and resonance patterns and geometries that happen in physics. This is well known and well understood. And what we're doing with our research and development is we're trying to find those frequencies, those signature resonances that apply to. The, the entity, the bioresonant entity, and all of its parts. We're trying to document those and put them down and compile the case studies and show a consistency of if you use this, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We're laying the, the foundation. The future of this technology is unlimited. Mm -hmm. And people are already using sound for healing. I mean, you've got ultrasound machines now, millions of dollars in hospitals to do ultrasonic scans. And, uh, and ultrasonic therapy, breaking up kidney stones and burning tissues and all kinds of things. Uh, I'm not big on ultrasound, by the way. I think a lot of I'm not either, but go ahead. I think a lot of people get harmed from that. In fact, I've treated people for scar tissue and so mm -hmm. forth that they've suffered with ultrasound. Yeah, it's really too strong uh, in, for, and not correct, <laughs> so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. And the, this kind of the same thing with uh, uh, electromagnetic therapies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel very strongly about that, too, because I believe that John Reed, the, the great cymatic researcher in England, Dr. John Reed, has written many papers on this subject and a couple of books and so forth, and he says the sound really is electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, yes, it is. He, he says there, there basically is no difference between electromagnetic signal and a, and a, a phonon chain of sound. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it does the same thing. It does the same thing to the molecules. They're both moving. They're both mm -hmm. vibrating. They're both making a sound. So basically, they're, if they're not exactly the same thing, they're definitely interwoven. Mm -hmm. So when you're using sound, you are changing the electromagnetic potential of that area you're using sound on. Mm -hmm. You're changing the molecular structure, you're increasing the biophotonic discharge, which is in turn affecting the electromagnetic fields and the uh, amount of electricity you're getting off of that area. Mm -hmm. it, it, it really is that simple. So that's my whole concept, well not whole concept, but a great deal of my concept is if we can apply light and color and sound to that area, we're going to increase the light and color and sound in that area. <laughs> and that's going to increase the electromagnetic flow and creation of biophotons and regeneration. Wow, wow. Well, I think this is a great place to put this idea out and make people take it in, take it, embrace it, let them come, so to speak, let them experience it for themselves let them get their own results, let them see the science, let them see, you know, I don't know, I think if some, a lot of people, if they get the results, uh, they could care about the science to the extent. If it's, the science helps us when we're not familiar with things, but this still has to be backed up by results. And you can call something scientific, but if the results don't support it, it's not science either, as far as I'm concerned. But so, we are expanding our definition, let us say, of science in the sense that this is not to be added to, this has been scientific all along, and the results have basically been confirming it. Well, yeah, exactly, and, and I don't have a doctorate in medicine, mm -hmm. and I don't pretend to be a doctor, but what I do claim to be is someone who's sensitive to what's actually going on <laughs> with people and the sound and their conditions. Mm -hmm. 
And we've observed this, and of course I don't work alone, I do work with doctors, and I do work with uh, nurses and practitioners and uh, massage therapists and light and color therapists, and uh, you know, I'm working, going to be doing a conference in a few weeks with these light uh, syntonics doctors who work with light in the brain and, and this sort of thing. Uh, which has been around a long, long time, and it's a very accepted science in optometry. So even though I don't have the, the degrees in these fields, what we're doing here, what we're accomplishing, the foundations that we're laying, really will be the foundations for the future. Long after I'm gone, people will be doing this, and they'll be doing even better and greater things than we're doing. You have results that many people, doctors with degrees, are not getting, okay? And as a patient or potential patient, client, whatever name you call it, I'd go with results more so than a degree, personally, okay? Well, so the bottom line with that therapy is there's absolutely no way you could possibly get hurt with it. Mm -hmm. You know, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. Well, it used to be, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> and, and the other thing that I'm very proud of is here at our healing center, we're completely nonprofit, so we also do no profit. <laughs> that works for us. So the healing services and so forth that we're offering are philanthropic, and they're research and development for uh, educational purposes and to further the understandings in these fields, and which is why a lot of scientists and intelligent people are now beginning to catch on. We've just got to increase the consciousness and keep spreading the bubble and eventually uh, people wake up to these realities. Dr. Gary Buchanan, the website is, let's say those. Sonotherapy.com. Thank you very much. You're welcome.